Uh, hello, everyone, and so I'd like to welcome you as well to this uh, first uh, uh, installment of uh, a series of seminars that uh, the Connective Project in uh, Vilnius University Faculty of Communication is uh, organizing. Uh, just a couple of things about who we are. My name is uh, Kostis Dallas. I'm an associate professor with the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto, and I'm also a principal investigator in this project, in the Connective uh, uh, Digital Memory in the Borderlands project where I work with a team of professors and uh, uh, researchers, early career researchers in the Faculty of Communication of Vilnius University in order to study interactions between uh, people uh, in the Lithuanian uh, social media space, especially on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, we contact uh, that involve uh, uh, memory, especially contested memory, difficult memories of the past, uh, and constructions of uh, identity, uh, as well as uh, approaches to the construction of the past. So this is more or less the framework in which uh, we work in this, and uh, the seminar series that we're organizing this year and the next year as well, and the remaining three years of the project, uh, are really uh, seminars that are meant to connect uh, the international conversation about issues of memory, identity, and heritage uh, with uh, uh, the Lithuanian research community and help us establish a focus of interest that will be transdisciplinary, that might involve also researchers and others uh, from uh, other universities, uh, uh, other fields, and other uh, disciplines. So the series of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, that we are organizing uh, is this here is called, is named Contested Heritage, Memory and Identity Practices, Eastern European and Global uh, Contexts. And in this year, we're not looking necessarily at the digital, we're looking at broader practices. And uh, indeed, uh, we are happy to uh, host uh, uh, our first speaker uh, in this year's seminars, uh, uh, Thea uh, Zinbeck Andersen. And I will now uh, just uh, pass again the baton to my colleague in the project, uh, uh, Donata Armakoskaite, uh, to introduce uh, Thea, and uh, uh, then we take on with uh, this first seminar. So I thank you all for being here with us. I hope that we're going to have a, an interesting and engaging discussion uh, after the talk and uh, look forward to further occasions also of meeting you in our seminars. Thank you. So Donata, you have the floor. Thank you, Kostas. Um, so just a few sentences about our main uh, guest and main speaker uh, of today. So Thea Andersen is Associate Professor of East European Studies at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, her research mostly focuses on the contemporary history of Southeastern Europe, especially uh, on issues related to cultural memory, uses of history, identity politics, uh, popular culture in Yugoslavic area, also the uh, contested and dissonant heritage in Southeastern Europe and meaning making uh, for today's uh, uh, memory and today's perception of this uh, heritage. Um, Thea is also author and editor of uh, writings that relate to difficult heritage, disputed memory, national identity, and much more. Um, she is also a member of the Executive Committee of the Memory Studies Association, and I think it's quite enough uh, to say about you, Thea. So welcome, thank you, and the scene is yours, and we are all eager to hear about your latest study of Goli Otok, the, the, the heritage site. So. Thanks so much, Donata. Um, and I'd like to start with uh, saying very much, thank you very much to, uh, to Kostas and Donata and Ingrida for, for having me here. It's really great to be allowed to have this, uh, this conversation with you. And I look forward to what you have to say to what I am presenting because really what I'm going to present here uh, about Goliotak is, um, is it work in progress very much. Um, it uh, opens a lot of perspectives that are new to me myself. Um, so I'll have, I, I may have more questions than answers to give you today. Um, and I should also, before I start, just uh, emphasize that uh, what I'm going to present here uh, is work produced in collaboration with my, my good friend and uh, colleague, Daniela Koleva from uh, the University of Sofia. 
And what we've been doing, Daniela and I, is we've been looking at two different sites of memory, two, two camps, um, uh, hers uh, just outside uh, Sofia in, 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 in the Danube, uh, Belene it's called, and then I've been looking at, at Goli Otok, and we've, uh, we've sort of been comparing and try to figure out how these two different cases inform each other. Um, so yeah, let's see what comes out of this. I'll try to share my screen. Do you see it now? Does it look okay? Yes. Good, perfect. So yes, uh, I'll be talking about the communist prison camp at Goli Otok, or rather I'd be talking about what is left of that. Um, so I'll be talking about Goli Otok as a, as a site of memory, as a legacy of descent, uh, or heritage of descent, if you like, and as a dark tourism destination. Um, so I'll be sort of walking around between these different ways of trying to conceptualize uh, how it is the past is being engaged with in the present by different agents, how different types of agenda are influencing the way that, that the Croatian society today and early on, Yugoslav society has been relating to the history of, of Goli Otok. So, what is Goli Otok? Yes, this is Goli Otok. Um, as you can see, it's a rather barren island, uh, and, and Goli Otok actually means naked island or barren island if you want. Um, and uh, it is not a particularly big island, it's about two kilometers across, um, so 4.5 square kilometers in total. Um, and this is what it looks like when you look out of the window of, of the bus to uh, to the island wrap, which is where you have to go to access this uh, this island. And I'll just show you where it is uh, geographically. So we are at the Croatian Adriatic coast. Uh, note the giant red arrow uh, and then the tiny dot, which is more green than on the picture I just showed you. And probably this is Google Maps lying a little bit to us. That's the island we're talking about. Um, and as you'll see, it is now part of, of, of the Croatian coastline, of the Croatian archipelago, and thus also of, uh, of the center of the very important Croatian tourist industry. Um, so it's quite, it's quite important to, uh, to, to Croatian self-understanding this area, not the island, but the region of Dalmatia. Um, what you can see also is that it's, or what I should tell you probably is that, um, this used to be Yugoslavia, of course. So uh, this present island used to belong to Yugoslavia before Croatia became an independent state uh, in 1991. And that of course is part of the reason why this island has such a complex and confusing history and thus also a rather complicated status today, I'd argue as site of memory and heritage site. So here is, what I will be uh, trying to uh, talk you through. So first I'll try to give you a, a brief history of the camp, uh, very brief, um, not quite doing it justice, but the main important bits you'll have to know to understand the discussion of, 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 of its heritage meaning after that. Um, then I'll talk about Goli Otek as a literary site of memory because I'll be arguing that that is how it, it's sort of established as a core memory site is through fictional literature, really. Then I'll be talking, and this will be much more open-ended and messy. Uh, this is the research going on. Um, Goli Otok as a site of dark tourism uh, or difficult heritage, um, legacy of descent history, if you like. Um, and the question behind all of this is, why is uh, Goli Otok, why does it have such, a, such an uncertain status as a historical monument or a site of memory or a, a heritage site? And just to yeah, point out what it is that I'm talking about is you see here on the image, uh, the sign that welcomes you to the island of Goli Otok when you go there as a tourist to visit it. And uh, as you see, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, in, it's in several languages and it's sort of a very brief uh, historicization of the place, uh, trying to introduce to you the main bits you'll see. So there is a certain, if you want, um, stage setting of how you're supposed to experience it as a tourist. But also what you see uh, in the bottom of the picture is actually a bit of rubbish. 
um, so a bit of garbage, uh, which sort of also comes with the way Goliotta looks. It's it's not kept in best shape, if you like. It's actually quite a messy place. I will get back to that. So Goliotok's history. Uh, the history of Goliotok uh, cannot be understood without framing it within the um, the history of, of Yugoslav communism and um, and the break that Yugoslavia went through with the, uh, the, the, the communist international organization, the Common Forum, led by Stalin and the Soviet Union uh, in 1948. So, Whereas communism was established in Yugoslavia in, uh, in 1945, following the, the victory of the Yugoslav uh, communist-led partisan army in the Second World War, it was initially a super Stalinist project. So obviously all the Yugoslav communists were dedicated supporters of Stalin. Uh, the whole reconstruction of Yugoslavia after the Second World War was framed in, uh, we follow Tito, the Yugoslav communist leader and Stalin, the, the 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 slogans uh, the, the the calls for, uh, for 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 uh, for rounding up for, for for making people support the uh, the campaigns for reconstruction were sort of made in the name of Tito and Stalin so it was definitely um, the 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 at the core of the way the Yugoslav communists saw themselves and then in 1948 it was quite a shock to the Yugoslav Communist Party to be expelled from uh, the common form, to be seen as, as, as renegades or even capitalist or um, anti, anti revolutionaries by the, the, the international communist movement. So they, in, in a very quick time, went from a quite uh, respected model communist state to something that was international barrier seen from the, uh, from the communist world. And uh, that created a number of challenges internally um, in Yugoslavia. So, so on one hand, it was an identity crisis uh, of, of, of a massive scale because the Yugoslav communists had to rethink themselves as proper revolutionaries in spite of being, um, being uh, completely uh, banned from the good communist party, a good communist company, if you want. But also, it was a huge threat to, uh, to the whole construction of both the regime and state security. Um, so the Yugoslav communists were afraid of an, in, of an invasion from, uh, from uh, the, the other communist states. They were afraid that the, the Soviet Union and Stalin would sort of initiate an invasion of Yugoslavia. And they were also quite afraid what would happen internally with the party uh, and the Yugoslav revolution itself. So uh, 1948 and the break with the, with the common form and, 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 and the Soviet Union, led to an internal um, an internal cleansing of the party. So a huge amount of people were uh, taken out or arrested or sent to the prison camp because they were suspected of supporting Stalin against Tito. Uh, that's why they, they are called common formists, supporters of the common forum, or in the, in the Yugoslav uh, jargon, obviously supporters of the information bureau. Um, and the thing is that this was obviously a, a very Stalinist procedure. Um, so, so the Yugoslav Communist Party cleaned itself. Um, 60,000 people probably were sort of suspected of perhaps supporting Stalin. And this was, of course, also in a secret service system. So they were real or they were suspected supporters of Stalin. We don't really know. Um, but um, we do know that probably around 17,000 people uh, were arrested uh, as supposed supporters of Stalin. And of these, uh, 13,000 were sent to, uh, to Goli Otak, uh, the island that I just showed you, where a, a prison camp was established. Um, so uh, we know that when it was most populated, the prison camp held up to 4,500 uh, prisoners at one time. And we know that for, for, uh, for, for, uh, for the period where it was specifically targeting uh, the, the supporters of Stalin, um, that is 1945 to 1956, uh, approximately 400 people actually died there uh, because of, of, of the violent practices, because of hunger, because of disease, because of, 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 of the merciless climate of that place. 
So in the years 1949 to, to 1956, uh, what characterized this, this prison island was its, its widespread use of hard and meaningless physical labor. So people would carry, it, it, it was initially intended that it might be used for um, a, a place for preparing marble for statues or for constructions of buildings. So there's a lot of stone, marble stone on the island, but not a very good quality. So the prisoners were made to carry these stones up and down of, of the hills as a sort of activity that would keep them, exhaust them. There was widespread violence, uh, both among prisoners and by so-called guards, often prisoners themselves. There was a widespread use of torture, but also sort of meaningless humiliation, forcing people to stand and watch the latrines all day or, or um, being sort of isolated um, by the other prisoners, not being allowed to talk to other prisoners, experiencing social isolation completely. Um, the idea behind this was becoming some sort of re-education of the prisoners. So they were supposed to uh, be cured from their support for Stalin and then become proper Titoists. So they were sort of forced to, to uh, repeat lines like, I'm a, I'm a common formist pig and uh, Tito is great and these sorts of things. So, so there was sort of a, an, an educational purpose to this in a way. One of the things that is often uh, being talked about in memoirs from prisoners is the way that, that the really damaging experience as a prisoner was the way that you were being policed and guarded by other prisoners. So this is, this is a similarity to, for example, the, uh, the Nazi concentration camps where you had the, 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 the use of, of, of some prisoners being, being made sort of guards in a way, the capos and that sort of thing. And they did the same at Goli Otak. So of course, the, the Yugoslav security police, the UDPA, was behind, but apparent, it appeared as if the, 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 uh, the prisoners were actually controlling and guarding themselves in a sort of self-organized labor system that sort of also created extra enmity, if you want, an extra uncertainty and a constant feeling of, um, of being unsecure about your fellow prisoners, of, of never being able to trust the environment you were in. Um, this information is uh, about the, 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 the prison camp, I should say. I stole mo most of it from Martin Previsic's uh, book, Poviest Gologotica, which is a, a fairly recent, uh, very good collection of what we know about Gologotica, but a lot of the knowledge is based on, on oral history and, uh, and people's memoirs. So this is the period that made Goli Otak infamous, if you want. That is the period we remember, the, the, the period of, 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 uh, of, of, of terror, if you want, on the island, of a terror regime on the island, of, of, um, of torture and of, of, uh, of degradation and of re-education of the prisoners. Then, as you all know, in 53, Stalin dies. In 56, the relationship between Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union becomes less tense. Um, and Yugoslavia has, after the break with the common form, been sort of developing in a different direction, a less, uh, if you want, repressive direction, uh, claiming that was developing a more open kind of, of socialism. So uh, it, it sort of got over its, its hunting of its potential internal Stalinists. Most of them were sort of released. Um, and the, the, the island of Goli Otok, the prison construction was turned over to uh, what you might call a prison for ordinary criminals. Um, so, well, basically people having committed ordinary crimes, but also uh, young delinquents, so people who were sort of not quite behaving. And that is quite a broad category, as far as I understand, because it moves over to the political prisoners as well. So you've got, you've got people who are sort of, of, of uh, promoting democracy or nationalism or that sort of thing were there as well, but also just young criminals. And a lot of the remnants and ruins that are on the island today is from that uh, period. And that, I should say, is less important for the island as a memory site. The, 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 the later prison years, which is interesting when you think about it, because it sort of gives you some thought about what is a proper victim of communism, if you like. What if, which, which types of victims would you like to remember are important to remember in, in, Croatia, in, in Croatia and Yugoslavia? cultural memory of this period. So the island was abandoned in 1988. 
and uh, the ruins and remnants of both the camp and the later youth prison and prison in general were basically left to wither. I should just mention that the picture to the right is a picture of uh, the, 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 the period of, 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 uh, of, 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 uh, of, of, of 1949 to 1956, when they were re-educating the, uh, the, 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 the suspected Stalinist communists, and they were sort of forced to do all these meetings and, and, and calls and sort of demonstrate their support to, um, to, uh, to, to, to Titoism. So they're being forced to stand in the round here and, and confess their, their faith in Tito. Right, so, how does this then become a site of memory? Because obviously this history of Goli Otak is not a particularly flattering history for the communist regime in Yugoslavia. Uh, it's not something that they were particularly keen to talk about a lot. So there is this, this eerie combination of silence and knowledge in the, in, in the years after 1956. Um, I'd still argue that it does develop through literature into a a site of memory. And what is it that I want to say with site of memory? Um, I'm borrowing here Pierre Nouras concept, which we all know and work with, I think, within memory studies. Um, so according to Nouras, uh, a site of memory is any significant entity, whether material or non-material in nature, which by dint of human will or the work of time has become a symbolic element of the memorial heritage of any community. So um, what's important to take with us here is that a site of memory does not have to be material. It can be anything, um, but it is something that has become a symbolic element. So, so really a symbol of a certain uh, memory uh, within a community. And also the other thing that it is a process. It's something that this symbol develops into becoming. Uh, it's, 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 it's through time, over time, by process something becomes a site of memory. Uh, or, and he, he, he phrases it beautifully in the second quote here. Uh, site of memory, says Pierre Noir, can capture the maximum possible meaning with the fewest possible signs. So it really is a super meaning-making icon, if you like. A site of memory is a reference point for a huge package of memory. So a lot of, of um, a lot of meanings are being activated through a site of memory. That's what in this. That's what's in this. Um, and Whitney has expanded on the concept of site of memory in a great way. I think uh, she says uh, the concept sites of memory. She says, and I quote, describes the process whereby places, texts, and artifacts become the focus of collective memory and of historical remembrance. And such sites, she says, are constantly being reinvested with new meaning and elicit intense attention from those doing the remembering. So we are still looking at the process and we're looking at the acts of investing these reference points with meaning. And I'm going to try to uh, convince you that this was done with the history of Goli Otak in, uh, in communist Yugoslavia, even though it was not something that you could very easily talk about. It was still created as a site of memory, and, and I think we should we should recognize the courage in actually doing that, and perhaps also the specificity of Yugoslav communism in doing that. But I'll be, I'll get back to that. So as I said, it was not a, a, a very much an easily talked about or very widely discussed topic, but it was still present in different ways in uh, in Yugoslav communist discourse. Yeah, I've I've got two quotes for you. One is uh, from uh, Vladimir Derya, uh, who is a journalist, uh, famously the uh, biographer of Tito himself. Um, and Derya sort of throughout his life uh, produced these huge history volumes, which were sort of um, exposing uh, Yugoslav history and also famously always exposing the less, uh, the less comfortable sides of it. Um, and in his book, about exactly about the break between Yugoslavia and, and, and the common form, the communist bloc of Eastern Europe, he describes Goliotak. And he says these words, that merciless system in that camp, this model miniature of a Stalinist Siberian camp 
was introduced to us by exactly those of our interrogators who were trained in the USSR. Um, and this comes after him describing how nasty the place was uh, and also um, how there's a tendency that, that, that in, this, in this period Yugoslavia was a Stalinist construction itself. Um, so what I want to get at here is that on one hand he recognizes it was there and it was a super nasty place uh, and something that is actually alien to Yugoslav communism is how he's presenting it. And then he sort of puts the responsibility basically with the Soviet Union. This is a Soviet thing that someone imported into Yugoslavia um, from the Soviet Union, but still he recognizes that Goli Otak is there. And this is of course a super public book. It comes from the communist inside circle if you want, and it's published in Sarajevo in 1969. So whereas I'd say, no, we did not talk, or well, people did not talk much about Goli Otak, but it could be talked about by the right people. It was there somehow, knowledge was there. And it's not only uh, internally in, uh, in Yugoslavia itself, there is a, an opening of the issue. Uh, so the emigre communities um, outside Yugoslavia did talk a lot about Goli Otak as well. And especially um, in the 70s and 80s, you see publication from emigre communities, um, people who left Yugoslavia after the Second World War because they didn't want to live in the communist uh, state would gather uh, evidence of what, what had happened at Goli Otsuk and then publish them. Um, and the thing about Yugoslavia, of course, was that the borders were open. So anything that was published in the emigre community to, could potentially be imported into Yugoslavia again, and people would be able to read and learn about uh, these issues. And I've got one example for you here, uh, which is Milovan Dilas' um, book, Rise and Fall, uh, which was published in, in London in 1983, but also published in, 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 in Serbia and could be brought into to Yugoslavia. And in that book, he talks about, Rise and Fall is his book about what it was like to be part of the establishment of the communist regime, and then what it was like to uh, become uh, a dissident, as Milovan Dilas himself did. He fell out with the communist leadership because he wanted more democracy. Um, so in, 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 the, in the late 50s, he became a political prisoner, basically. Um, and this is then his memoirs of what what, what Yugoslavia was like. And he talks about Goli Otak in those, and he says, Goli Otak was the darkest and most, most shameful fact in the history of Yugoslav communism. No one who put in time on the island returned home, nor do I think that those who ran this camp will ever rest easy. So you have an obvious uh, recognition of how incredibly nasty this camp was um, and what a dark legacy it really is and, and should be seen as. And, also a bit interesting here that, and this is another voice that comes from what used to be uh, the, uh, the internal power circles of, of Yugoslavia. So definitely not silence, not even in, in the communist period. But the great breakthrough does not come from these guys, but from fictional literature in, in the early 1980s. Um, and the early 1980s, all the 1980s in general in Yugoslavia was a period of crisis. So Tito died in 1980. And you see uh, something that seems like a political confusion in the country. Um, and then you also see uh, a search of rethinking the past. What, what were Yugoslav communism and what, what is it going to be? And within that whole openness, you also see an appearance of fictional literature that address Goli Otsok. And I think it's interesting, it's fictional. So these are not memoirs. These are people having heard stories from Goli Otsok and then retelling them. And here's the first example. This is Branko Hoffmann's Night Till Dawn, which was first published in Slovenian in 1981 and then translated into Serbo-Croatian in 1982. Um, and there's this quote where the, the main, the main uh, character is, is a dedicated partisan himself. And he, he's sent to Goli Otak together with, with a friend who is not particularly politically invested, actually a bit of a simpleton maybe, who doesn't really understand what's happening. Uh, and then the narrator tells the story of what happens to them when they arrive to Goli Otak. And he says, they had beaten him to death. First they broke one of his legs, then beat him like a dog. All that remained was a tortured body that they throw into the sea and somewhere just a number inscribed in some statistical table. So what you get here is an expression of uh, brutality, of mindless violence, and also of complete indifference 
to the people sent there. It's quite a powerful uh, representation, I'd argue. It's really, it's really quite scary. Um, and what it describes is one of these famous uh, practices of, of Goli Ortok. So when you arrived to the island as a new prisoner in the, uh, the period when it was a, a, a camp for Stalinists, you would be met by all the uh, already um, all, all the prisoners already there who would make then a row and and, and and you'd have to run between them standing uh, and then they'd beat you with various items on the way up there and that is what kills the narrator's friend in this case so it's called running the gauntlet or or what you'd call it really the 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 if you want the introductory ritual for a new prisoner to golly otak and and the narrator's friend is basically killed in that process here so quite quite scary and quite focused on the cruelness and, and the violence and the meaninglessness of the whole thing. And I have another example for you, which is again from fictional literature. It's from uh, Antony Sakovic's Train Droit, or Moment Number Two. Um, and this is a really scary book. It's even more violent than uh, Branko Hoffman's one. Uh, it's, it's a sort of a series of, 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 of narrators meeting, meeting up, so it becomes sort of a collage of different narrators talking about their experiences at Goli Ortok. So it becomes sort of incoherent and, and uh, terrifying in that way as well. You've got different voices coming in here. And at the moment, this voice uh, is, is, is describing how his experience was at, at Goli Ortok. Uh, and he talks about being isolated. As I said, the prisoners were sometimes so so chose a certain prisoner who was sort of boycotted and the others wouldn't talk to that person and you'd be sort of beaten up by the other prisoners. And he talks about how in the second boycott, they tore up both my ears and broke the skull. And he gets into the hospital um, and then he's taken out of the hospital, the narrator, and, and, and brought to uh, interrogation. Um, and then he's being interviewed here. Uh, and, uh, and, and he says here in Goli Otak, I've been beaten up. Here yeah, I've lost my teeth. And I've won twice through the gauntlet that practice of beating people when they when they were uh, arriving here. And then you've got the interrogator saying, but this is your own, own initiative. You have created this. And that refers back to that idea of the self-management of the prisoners. So these are the prisoners themselves who are beating each other, is the argument here. And um, so you get that the combination of the torture and, and the nightmarish condition that this is actually an internal logic. Of, of the prisoners community, which of course isn't the case, but in, in, in a lot of the later memoirs as well, we see that exactly that experience of, of being, being beaten up by your, by your fellow prisoners as one of the most traumatic. So these books, especially these two are what made, uh, but, but they are this as well, are what made Dolly Otok into a, a known site of memory and narrative discursive memory, if you want or a narrative discursive side of memory, if you want. Um, and they, they are also what later history books will refer to and recite as sources to what we know about Goli Otok, which is also why Martin Previsic's book, which I mentioned, the one from, from 2019, is one of the most serious, actually proper history studies of it, and, and a fairly new phenomenon in a way. So these fictional accounts became referred to as Goli Otok literature. Um, and one of the literary critics of, of, of Yugoslavia then, in 1982, Sladak Matvajevic said about, the, he was the one who termed it Goli Otok literature. We dare not close our eyes to this literature as if, as if, it, were, as, as if it was not there. So really you see the, uh, the acceptance of the literature as a site of memory. Right, I should speed up a little bit, I see, because I promise not to talk for too long. And I have a lot to say. So, <clears throat> just to sum up the importance of, 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 of this literariness, this, the literary side of memory of Dolly Otak, I'd just like to draw your attention to this, um, this new book, or fairly new book, from 2006, Stasa Stanisic's How the Soldier Repairs the Gramophone, originally published in German. And what Stanisic does here is he makes a random reference or a very unexplained reference, at least, to Goli Otok as one of the defining features of Yugoslavia. So he says, this is uh, the, the main protagonist in Stanisic's book, is asking his dad about Yugoslavia. And then he says, my dad's always so confusing. And then comes the quote, he'll talk 
not about Yugoslavia, but some unnamed kingdom where there are words for things that don't exist and things for which there can't be any words. If someone invents a word for something that, that otherwise floats namelessly around in the world, he will, as a punishment, be sailed to an island which does not have a proper name either and is therefore called the Naked Island. So he sort of, Stanisic doesn't explain, he just expects us to know that this is Goli Otok and that we then understand the whole Stalinist repression system of Yugoslavia. Right, so having established this discursive textual literary side of memory, what happens then um, when Yugoslavia falls apart and when Croatia takes over this present camp and sort of, if you want to have national ownership of it uh, and has to figure out what to do with it as a site. So it was abandoned in 1988, communism falls in 1990, Yugoslavia falls apart in 1991, then there's a war from 1991 to 1995, and then Goli Otak is within the premises of independent Croatia. And this is when I'd argue it becomes a site gradually of dark tourism. So this is you. What is dark tourism? Dark tourism is generally understood to be uh, the activity of traveling to visit sites of human suffering, atrocities, and death. However, Tony Seaton in uh, the Palgrave Handbook of Dark Tourism has said that we should think of it as a memory activity. It is a memory praxis. He says, remembrance of death and the death induced by symbolic representation. That is dark tourism, and that is really a memory act, if you want. That's a memory practice. The key motive uh, or the key motives for dark tourism, uh, says the literature, would be remembrance, education, and entertainment. So that combination of, of of the gory and the interesting and the entertaining. And I'd add to that myself, uh, I think there's an interesting sort of idea of sense. We are sensing the suffering. There's, we are being, we are sort of censoring the, uh, uh, the, 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 the error of history around us, the atmosphere of history. And now we're getting to the site of Goliata a little bit. So this is how you get to Goliata with this uh, boat taxi uh, called Goli Express. And, uh, you see the picture of the little guy in the uh, in, in behind the fences there, and I think what this image partly does is to sort of convey both that meaning of terror and, if you want, kitschiness uh, and and private initiative and not very sort of solemn nor professional approaches to the past, which you would see in other types of of of, of memory tourism. I'd add, I'd argue. So as a touristic site. Goli Otak also has a sort of strange in-betweenness. It is, it is interesting and it's also pleasant in a way and it's scary as well. So if you look at the Lonely Planet Guide from 2015, they talk about Goli Otak and they say day tours by boat, including swim stops and visits to nearby islands such as Sveti Gergur and the infamous Goli Otak are offered by many travel agents. So here it sort of becomes part of a, a tourism package and you go swimming and then you visit this infamous prison with it's complicated forms of torture. And I find that strange. And there's an interesting tension in that. And, and actually, when, when, when I was there at this summer, you could, you could still meet people who were there on a, on a swimming trip. That's not an unusual activity. So you see that a combination of a pleasure tourism and uh, dark tourism. If you look at people's references of what it's like to visit it, and I have done that on TripAdvisor, the, the, the general thing is that you see a combination of people who are sort of a little bit bored by the lack of facilitation there and, and another group of people who are sort of very taken in by its its destroyedness it's not being uh, heritageized it's not being institutionalized and they sort of really sense that that feeling of death around it so yeah i've got a quote from one here who said the sheer scale of the place and the sense of what horace must have gone on make it utterly fascinating and very humbling so you've got that Thing about the tourists going there and sensing the atmosphere of it. So what's it like as a tourist site? There is a certain amount of tourist infrastructure on Goli Otak. This is what meets you when you land there. This is a little train that can take you around in 20 minutes to see the main spots on the island. And you of course see there's a, an ice cream bar over there and behind Behind me, as I took this photo, is a, is a restaurant where you can serve, where, where they serve grilled meat and fish. So you sort of have a, the idea of pleasure and entertainment combined with visiting 
the place. And I think there's something to, to it that relates to who is doing this, because it's really a lot of private initiative, as far as I understand. Ooh. And here was another thing. Yes. Um, so, and the private initiative is also running through the way that the place is being institutionalized, because even though you do have that slightly Tivoli-esque, or if you want, uh, banalizing character of, of the little yellow train and the ice cream bar, you also have a lot of, of, of a group of local people trying to invest the thing with, with an educated potential. So you've got these signs all over that will explain the different parts of, of, uh, of the camp. Um, what happened in in the buildings which you get around to visit in the in the train there so there is a tourist infrastructure and there is the possibility of quite good information combined with the ice cream shop um and as i said it it is a grassroots thing largely that sort of creates this infrastructure so this is the moby dick diving um service or diving um uh, business and the, they are the ones running the Goli Express taxi boat that can take you to visit the prison island. And often they combine it with, uh, with people going further to go snorkeling or, uh, or diving uh, elsewhere. So, so I was on a diver's boat, sitting on the roof of a diver's boat, and then they dropped me off at the prison island, then they went on diving the other people. And I, I think there's something interesting and complicated in that combination of, of, of the private initiative, which needs to make money and be pragmatic and practical and the, the way that they want us to understand the seriousness of the place. So if you want to learn something about Goli Otak, you can also get hold of, of, of a Goli guide, which is freely available on the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung's homepage. Um, and also it, it is, it's been produced by Croatian historians, really good ones, uh, 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 an organization called Documenta. One of them behind this guidebook is actually the, the aforementioned Martin Prebisic. So you've got quite a drive uh, to sort of make the educative uh, and the sort of serious memory, uh, what can we learn from this memory? How can we respect the past? That side of that agenda is present as well. Um, and I have got, I've put this in here as a very brief and much too short mention of all the people in Croatia. And there are no, numerous, numerous, there's a leader, at least a handful of organization that would like to contribute to a more serious kind of monumentalization and heritageization of the place to actually have a proper site of memory. But it hasn't happened. And therefore we still have that grassroots dark tourism in betweenness of the island. I think we'll get back to that. This is what it looks like uh, in some places, like abandoned heritage, I'd argue. Um, the uh, ice cream stand umbrella, the not really used grill. On the other side, you have uh, um, some of the buildings that are just basically completely abandoned and uh, local farmers keep sheep on the island of Goli Otok as well. So you've got that happening too. But that's not the only thing, that's just part of it, um, but something that kind of comes to your eye when you, when you visit the site. Then you have an interesting uh, process of some of the visitors or people actually clearly wanting to emphasize the Croatianness of the site. And I find that quite interesting. So you've got, there's a lot of graffiti on the leftovers of the buildings. Um, and here you see the, the Croatian flag, or the Croatian national shield, the Shahovnica, uh, which is on a, on a, as a graffiti. On, on one of the buildings here, and also on the floor here, uh, or on the ground here. And um, if you remember, in one of the first slides, I showed that picture of the prisoners in the Stalinist era camp uh, surrounding the star uh, for, 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 for round call for meeting up in the morning. This is the same square uh, with the, 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 the Shahovnica in, in, in white marble stone and red brick. So I'm kind of wondering whether there's a and sort of a, a, a reference point by the, the author behind the Shehovnica uh, here, back to this, the Red Star. So you sort of have, have, a, have it could be a, a symbolic taking national ownership of a site that belonged to a different, um, different ideological uh, setup. So why is it and how is it that it's not really got 
a position, I'd argue, or not a clear position as a site of, 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 of memory, as a, as a heritage site uh, today in Croatia. Uh, and how does it work as a, in the political debate surrounding this? Um, so um, I've, trying to, I've been trying to look into a little bit into how politicians uh, position themselves in, in, in relationship to, uh, to Goli Otto. Um, and there is a, a, a strange tension in how they relate to it. So clearly to some, it is, as I said, something that should be monumentalized and remembered. And these two guys, these two local historians, who wrote an article about how Goliata has been abandoned, and how we should really reconstruct it back in 2001, call it one of the most shameful parts of Croatia's history. So you've got that perspective, but then you also got the problem of how to how to make that into a useful heritage from a political perspective. Um, and here I think is where we sort of enter that question of what to do with complicated, difficult heritage. And of course, when I talk about that, I'm borrowing the insights from Sharon MacDonald uh, about what difficult heritage is. And she says, Sharon MacDonald, that difficult heritage is a past that is recognized as meaningful in the present, but that is also contested and awkward for public reconciliation with a positive self-affirming contemporary identity. So it's something that is both important, but difficult to connect to the public identity, to politics, to, to, to identity politics, if you want, and memory politics as well. And again, I think there's, a, 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 I'll just show you some of the perspectives that politicians have, and then I'll make my confused statements about that afterwards. Because on one hand, you have uh, then Prime Minister Yadanka Kosor, uh, who visited uh, Goli Otak in 2011 on the 25th of July. Um, and on the one hand, uh, Yatanka Koso was with the two guys who talked about, or all the other guys who talked about, we need to commemorate, and women, of course, we need to commemorate Goli Otak. So she said, we do need to decide on how to preserve uh, the parts uh, that represent the, uh, uh, the, the past of the communist regime and, and the victims, the memory of, of those. We need to conserve that memory. And she talks about how we need to sort of uh, decide what to do with it. On the other hand, she also says, uh, uh, we will ask of the agency, and that's the agency administering state property, to give suggestions as to how Goli Otak can be placed in service of the economic development of Croatia and this region, primarily tourism. So you've got that combination of we need to commemorate the victims, we need to commemorate the communist terror, but at the same time, we need to develop business here. Uh, so there's a, this meeting between memory politics and pragmatic uh, economic politics, if you like. And I think that is something that still hasn't really been finished its negotiation. Though we see a stronger emphasis now on the need to remember the victims of communism. So since uh, Yadan Kakosov's visit in 2011, it's become a more sort of typical pattern that uh, Croatian politicians visit Goli Otak on the 23rd uh, of August. Um, and that's, of course, the, uh, the, the day of the molotov ribbentrop Pact, or the day of, of remembering the victims of fascism and totalitarian regimes. Um, so they now do that. And this is uh, the prime minister doing so in 2020 um, and laying down a flower and, and reminding us all that we need to remember um, Dolly Otter, of course. This year, uh, it wasn't the prime minister himself. It was this guy. Uh, Oleg Butkovic, who is the Minister of, of Maritime Affairs, Transport and Infrastructure. And he was on, on Goli Otak also on the 23rd of, of August this, then this year. And, uh, and he said this, Mr. Butkovic, he said, um, we honor the victims of the communist regime, which marked the history of the 20th century, as well as the history of Croatia and the Croatian nation. The culture of memory and facing the truth is essential because there will be no peace and coexistence if we do not confront some things, sorry for the spelling mistake here, from the past. And I, I should, of course, excuse these are my translations, so I might get, 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 the, get the, the poor Croatian politicians slightly uh, misquoted, but that's the essence of what he's saying. What I think is important here is that Mr. Butkovic is definitely emphasizing the need for serious 
remorseful, if you want, or at least solemn memory politics in relationship to Golly Otto. So there's a tension with that, I think, as opposed to Yatanka Kosos, um focus on tourism. And also, inevitably, I can't help thinking there's also a tension between that and the private initiative and the grassroots kind of tourism industry that we see, or tourism facilitation, if you want, that we see happening on Golly Otto now. So there's definitely an, an unsolved uh, issue at, at stake here, I think. So why is it so complicated? And that's basically my conclusion, because I, I as I said, I, I don't really know what to conclude. I'm more still working with the questions here, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. So why is it not very easy to turn Goli Otak into a a site of, of memory, a, a proper physical institutionalized heritage site for the victims of communism. Um, and I, I do think that is a serious question because in, in looking at it one way, you'd think it was just a, a ready-made case of perfect memory politics. Here you have a, a communist repressive, a, a symbol of, of communist repression. The democratic nation state could use that to emphasize how, how bad Communism was how important dem democracy is. You could definitely use it for educational purposes. And you could even say that this was a Yugoslav construction. The Croatian state does not need to take responsibility for it. So you don't even have to take on that bit of national shame that in Sharon McDonald's cases, what, what's happening in Germany, where you have that negotiation of, of taking responsibility for the Nazi past, but still and still preserving the monuments. So it should be easy, you'd think, but apparently it's not. At, at least the, 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 they don't do it and haven't been doing it for, 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 for the 30 years since, uh, since Croatian independence. So there must be something else. And I'm thinking that there, as I said, there are lots of initiatives, there are lots of grassroots energy in this, and also lots, several organizations at least, and artistic attempts to sort of make something of a memory site out of it. But there's no clear political line or ambition, I think. And that is maybe at the core of, it, core of it, the lack of political decision-making really in, in, with regard to this. Then I'm wondering about the sheer pragmatics of it, uh, that it would be too expensive to turn it in to, uh, to a real mnemonic site. It's not very conveniently situated, though you could easily sail there from, from even from mainland Croatia, but it is still at a distance, not in the middle of any of the greater cities. Um, so it may be too expensive, maybe too uncertain for proper investment. If we get back to Yaldanga Kosos thinking about, we want a tourism that works. We want to develop the, the economic infrastructure of the area. So maybe it's too complicated. That's part of what I'm thinking about. Um, then there is the issue if it's actually not really a very useful history. And I just made the case of why I would see it as a meaningful site of memory, but uh, perhaps the victims are wrong. And, and we, I, I just mentioned the issue about which, which types of victims, most of the victims and the victims that are core in, in, in the literature that established Goli Otak as a site of memory, they are dedicated proper Stalinists. So these people who were tortured and some even killed at Goli Otak were kind of part of, 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 of the ideology that the contemporary Croatian state really wants to distance itself from. They were pro-Yugoslav and they were definitely super communists. So, so maybe that is part of it. Um, and then I'm just in the end thinking that perhaps they don't really mind. Perhaps a vague but powerful side of memory is actually quite useful from a political point of view. Um, and I'm also saying that because uh, because it's apparently a, a general tendency in, in Croatian memory politics that it's very difficult to make politicians invent decisively or invest decisively in insights of memory. Um, and I should say that the vagueness is probably something they're using. So when Mr. Butkovic, uh, the, the, the Minister for, for Transport, etc., visited Goli Otak this year on, on, on the 23rd of, of August, um, he was part of a larger, so he was there, uh, other Croatian minister, ministers went to other places remembering victims of communism. No one on the 23rd of August in Croatia went, went to visit Jasenovac, the main site of victims of fascism in, in Croatia, and actually the site of, of victims of Croatian fascism. So they are sort of maneuvering around these different uh, sites of memory in, in a quite 
if you want elastic way or flexible way. And I'm kind of wondering if that's not part of the reason why no proper decision has been made so far. Thank you. And I look forward to hear what you think about this. Thank you very much, Tia. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments or something you would like to say or share? Maybe somebody visited Goli Otok? No. I have one question then. Uh, you mentioned um, really shortly about the oral history. Uh, are there any collected interviews perhaps from former uh, prisoners which survived Goliotok or, or somebody, something like that? Um, and uh, if there are, maybe you, you have experienced how do those people react to the subject uh, getting uh, uh, new meanings as tourism site, as, as, as visiting site? What's a super interesting question. Um, so, yes. Uh, and, and for example, Martin Previsic's book is based largely on, on, on oral history as well as, um, as well as whatever he could find in the archives. But the thing obviously is that not much archive material existed about Goliath because it wasn't supposed to be really talked about too much. Um, so there's definitely lots of lots of oral history material, and also we've got large collections of memoirs. So even though I argued that it was fictional literature that created that created this as a, as a site of memory initially, um, since then, especially in, in in the late 80s and the 1990s, uh, collections of memoirs came out quite largely. Um, one, I haven't seen any. Uh, sort of direct considerations in these oral history interviews about the lack of commemoration. But one of the organizations that have been really working hard for, for creating a more proper memory site at Goli Otok is the Antezemlia Association, which is named after one of the, one of the survivors of, of Goli Otok. And it was when, when these, uh, most of them are by now have passed away, but, but in, 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 in earlier decades, they, they were, they 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 met up in that group, so that was a that was a a, a community of, of of survivors and other people who wanted to to create a a, a, mem, a memoir a, a monument of a kind properly, maybe even a monumental museum, I think, or something like that was what they aimed for. Uh, so there's definitely an interest among survivors to have that done, and also you see survivors collaborating. There was a a beautiful uh, documentary done uh, ten years ago, maybe about about Goli Otto, where one survivor guides you around the island and tells about what happened where. So, so they seem to be into commemorating it. Thank you. Um, we have a comment from Elina. She says that uh, your lecture here was amazing. She found it very oh, interesting. Nice. Uh, and uh, she would like to go there. Uh, it's, it is enough to see it on the screen. Oh, she wouldn't like to go there. It is enough to see it on the screen. And you are a br brilliant storyteller. So, oh, thanks. That is applause for you. Okay. <laughs> thanks. Um, I have one more question about the tourism industry, which you um, uh, also talked. Um, if I understood correctly, they um, organize uh, trips to the Goli Otok. Do they uh, make some kind of thematical, uh, I don't know, travels there or uh, guided tours or something like that? Uh, or, or is it just uh, um, for the people just to find this, uh, the subject themselves to walk around and that's it? Um, other people do that. So there are also organizations organizing guided tours and they collaborate with the, uh, the diving company. So, they, so you sort of, if you do this particular guided tour that I saw announced, then you have to meet up at the, at the taxi boat with the guide and then he'll take you around. Also, you see um, sometimes tourist groups come on different boats. So, so other tours are organized uh, by agencies, I imagine. 
and then people are being guided around. So you have it's got different, and all these sort of private initiatives and people retelling the stories in their way. So you don't what what I what you don't have is a uh, if you want top down politically planned monumentalization of the island's history. So it's it's really left to private initiative very much. So you can never know what meanings uh, does this island get after the tour for, for the people which visit, visited them, isn't it? No, I, I imagine you could you could get all sorts. Um, but as I also showed you, you, you can, if you want, you could go, you could you could follow the tour that uh, that the the, the, the weird little train does, or you can walk the trains too, and then you'd find signs on the buildings, or you could download the guide show, the guide tour mm -hmm. I showed, uh, from, uh, from the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, um, and you can follow that one, which is what I personally did. <laughs> um, so you, you've got all sorts of options, and, and then I suppose you can go there and go swimming and go back. I saw some people do that, and, and not at all interact with uh, the narrative of, 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 of the prison. Mm -hmm. But I suppose that's quite a, that's a specific choice as well, right? Because when you go in the taxi boat, you will be exposed. No. If you go in one of the taxi boats, you'll be exposed to the story because it will have that inside. Whereas if you take the diving boat, which was where I was put, you'll just sit next to a lot of diving equipment and then be dropped off at Goliath. So you're quite right. But then I suppose, isn't that the case with every memory site, really? You can never know what people take. Um, only this is even less um, organized, if you like. Mm. And my last question: <laughs> um, Did you uh, you showed us uh, one um, comment on TripAdvisor? Did you analyze the, uh, other feedbacks on social media about this uh, object? Or, and and what do usually people post about it? How do they feel after after visiting the island? Yes, a uh, great question too. And I mainly did TripAdvisor, um, but uh, there, there are a number of, of, um, of, of, of comments there. And, and, and as I said, they either go, this is, this is, this is boring and too hot uh, and, 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 and the grill is too expensive, or they go, isn't it amazing that they didn't plan it more for us? So there's a lot of this, uh, this was really a, a massive ex experience. I did find it uh, recommended, or actually Daniela Koliba did, found, found it a recommendation on it, f uh, f for it on a, on a web page on dark tourism sites, which sort of introduces dark tourism sites and really talked about how, how fantastic this one is. And I also found um, a person writing a blog who was a dedicated, uh, <laughs> he, really, he really liked traveling around to prison places apparently and, and, and sites of execution. So, so a dedicated dark tourism person and he just loved it for its, its uh, I think most of all for its lack of, of being organized. I mean, he was really, so not really a good answer, but um, I, I think the sense of, there's also one, one more thing that I saw a number of, of, of visitors pointing to is the way that you can explore yourself. So you have the experience of actually uncovering that sense of history. So you don't, you don't get the sense of history served in a ready-made way. You can slightly uncover it yourself and explore it. And, and that, that seemed to sort of give some people a, a stronger sense of the site. Gave, gave, the messiness gave it a, a, a ring of authenticity to, 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 to quite a, a number of visitors too. Thank you. We have one question from the audience. Irina, feel free to ask whatever you want. Hello, everybody, and thank you for the presentation. And I have a, a couple questions. Um, I really would like to know if you have any information how um, the site is popular, how much the site is really popular, and is it more popular between the locals or is it uh, more popular like uh, uh, between the foreigners? So it would be the first question. Um, I don't know, I can keep on going <laughs> or you would like to <laughs> answer? Uh, because this will be a short answer because I don't have definite data. That's part of, that's part of what I need to move on with because I can't, I can't really see any other way to do this than to ask 
the, the all these different private uh, entrepreneurs running the thing. Um, and I didn't get around to do that in the first place. I did ask around at the Moby Dick thing and they have like two tours a day and their boats take up to 20 people. And that is in, in, in the main tourist season. And the people I saw visiting were primarily foreigners uh, doing it as part of their week long holiday on this island. So um, yeah, that'll be the tentative answer. I don't think it's a, it's a very popular site. You have to make an effort to visit it. Uh, thank you. And uh, then I have another question. So if it's not so much popular as a tourism destination and site, let's say, and it's not like, as I understand, not contributing in an economical way for the country, like, uh, um, is it like, could we say that this is more like popular as a symbolic, um, uh, symbolic place? Uh, for politicians, not even for tourists or for, okay, for society as well, uh, through politicians who make a statement, some kind of statement through this uh, island uh, and uh, like uh, the place, like for example, the fight for the totalitarianism and uh, uh, like statements as that. What do you think about this thought? Super good question. Um... Yes, I, th I think that, uh, part of that, that's part of what interests me, that, that tension between uh, something that is a, a, a very established, quite powerful literary side of memory. So everybody with a, sort of a bit of a knowledge of, 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 uh, of, of, of history, culture of, of, of the Yugoslav area knows about, have heard about Goliotsa. So it's a phrase, it's a reference that immediately makes you think about communist repression and torture and, and that sort of thing. Um, so it's, it's so well known as a reference, but so few people actually visit it, I think. And it, especially because uh, there's n only the private entrepreneurs are willing to sort of invest and create an infrastructure that allows you to visit it. So there's sort of this weird uh, uh, difference or, or, or um, uncertainty, strange relationship between the way it's known and its active role. It's, it's quite ignored really as, as, as a tourist destination if you want, except exactly as you say, now and then the, the, the politicians visit it and use it in that symbolic battle against uh, communism. And of course that's currently, uh, Croatia has a, a right-wing leaning government and they are very keen to emphasize uh, all the crimes of communism. Um, and that's what they then do on the 23rd. And they can, they can, uh, they can use Goli Otok for that as well. Thank you so much. And I still have another question. Uh, um, okay, so um, thank you for the answer. And I wanted to ask about what is your own opinion? What is the, what is the, the best um, um, way to, let's say, how we can uh, make these places really important and very, very useful, like really useful for society? What would be your opinion? Uh, should it be dedicated for the victims? Should it be dedicated, like, let's say, for the political statements? Or maybe it should be like a place for uh, development of tourism? Like, what is your opinion? What is the best way? Or like, what, what, what you could say about that? Oh, that's a difficult one. Um, mm, I, I, um, I, I, I think, I think I would personally, uh, but I feel a little bit bad about saying that. But I would personally support the creation of a of a, of a memorial museum, and uh, something that was more of a convincing monument, because I do think that this is a history that deserves to be remembered. Um, and I think it deserves to be remembered, not least because of its internal contradictions, because these are the victims we don't really want to remember. These are this, this is a story about uh, a system fighting itself, if, if you like. And it's a story about uh, brutality, uh, unlimited brutality uh, created also by, by, almost by accident. So, 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 so it, it, it really is a, 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 a a terrifying monument to uh, to to uh, the, the degree to which a project can go wrong, if you like. <laughs> um, and I think it could be a very useful pedagogical monument for that. Um, 
but that would be uh, an expensive investment. And I am, it really doesn't fall to me to, to tell the poor Balkan countries what they should spend their money on, I think. Um, and I have, I have a little bit the same thing with the, there is a, there's a concentration camp in the middle of Belgrade, Stato um, Saimiste, where, where, where the, the, the invention of, of the mobile gas van and the first gassing of, of, of the Jewish community took place. And really it should be a core monument in European history. But I mean, Belgrade is a poor city um, and it perhaps it should spend the money on a hospital. You never really, it, 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 it is a complicated thing uh, how, to, how to do that. But um, I can't help thinking that it would, it, if Croatia wanted, if, it, if, it, if, 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 if it, the Croatian political elite could agree to make a, a, a memorial museum, it would be a great memorial museum. It would be a great uh, sort of contribution to, to uh, unsimplifying, if you want, the historical narrative of Croatia, because it tends to be very either either social democratic, the communists weren't so bad, or very right wing, the communists were super bad, and how great it is that we got rid of, of Yugoslavia. And of course, that's not how people think, but that's how the public memory very much uh, phrases it these days, I think. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Kostis. You are the second one who yes, raised Thank you. Thank you, Taya, for a truly inspiring and rich uh, talk, really. Lots, lots to think uh, about here. So one question, I was really sort of prompted very, very much by your one of your questions, the one about ambiguity and should the, the, this site be specific or generic? How does it operate? Does it operate through generalization or through the specifics? And really it calls to mind uh, all this uh, genealogy almost of um, museums of genocide, museums of suffering, because it's all over the world, right? Of course, the, the, you know, the main template is Holocaust museums, but there are others like uh, in Lithuania, there is the Museum of uh, Occupations and the Freedom Fighters. And in, in every country, there's such museums. And so I was wondering in the case of, uh, of the Goliotok, uh, uh, Goliotok, how does it operate in, in terms of communication? Does it operate through uh, telling a story that is very, very much specific to these people? Is this what is emphasized? Or is the universal aspect uh, of uh, suffering in a prison when you are a political prisoner emphasized? So I was wondering somewhere between these two things and so how, what, how it functions. Does it function through the narrative memory of those specific people? Or does it function more like uh, by symbolizing the suffering that people, you know, sustain in, in the hands of, uh, of oppressors and of, uh, of uh, authoritarianism on the other side. Yeah, yeah, quite a good question. I think uh, in, in, in its own presentation towards the tourists, uh, well, the phrase in English is the creation Alcatraz. So you're supposed to think about uh, terrifying prisons and the Count of Monte Cristo and, and a, a little bit. So it, it, it is very universalizing in that way. Um, and then also universalizing uh, here prisoners experience that it's telling the story of the side. Um, but it's also putting it in, in the story of, 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 of the battle between uh, Tito and Stalin. Um, so the, uh, the, the, uh, the youth prison and the, and the political prisoner period from 56 and onwards is not particularly important and because you, also because it gets less terrifying there. But interestingly, uh, in the, if you want, in the in the in the uh, literary memory and the and, and, and the history written about Goliath, they talk a lot about uh, a site called Peter's Pit, uh, which is apparently where the sort of the 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 ultra hardcore Stalinists, those who'd been volunteering for the Spanish Civil War and had been part of Comintern before the Second World War, they were interned there apparently and supposed to be just a hole in the ground, and you've got really really awful stories about that place, and that's not marked for the guided tour. So uh, there is a, I, I don't know, a, a, a def definitely a selection there that this was just either too weird or too difficult to mark or also the, the train tour is only 20, min only 20 minutes. So perhaps they didn't have time basically. Um, I don't know if I really answered your question or I sort of, um, it's, it's one thing that it does quite find is it definitely explains the point of the buildings. So the buildings that are still visible and all, especially those that are visible from the from the uh, from the Stalinist period, uh, they, they sort of 
tell the function of the site as such. So it's very much a site related thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the point of the question was really to somehow sort of highlight uh, the significance maybe of uh, whether all these sites of memory become sites for cultural exceptionalism or for ethnic exceptionalism in a way, or whether they become sites where you can have multiple discourses and multiple narratives being built. And it's like uh, the idea of really uh, uh, the possibility of a multiple golly otok where people can see their own experience and empathize with uh, uh, experiences with others, not necessarily putting themselves obviously in the lives of those that, uh, the ambiguous lives of those that uh, may be the sufferers as well. So is this, this kind of question. Well, it's an open question, really. It's uh, something that concerns me as well in the context of our own interests in uh, how memory in uh, Lithuania is constructed from the bottom up, regarding yeah. the difficult and troubled uh, um, contestations of uh, history. And, um, yeah, and I think it's a super interesting question, and I kind of tend to think that probably it stays very much, that's my impression at least, from, from sort of having looked at what the site looks like and how the, how the different buildings are and what, what the signs give you, um, it states very much on the surface. So it's just this happened here. So I would say it leans towards the universal people in a prison camp suffer. Um, and it doesn't really dig down to, to strong sort of individualizing such as the Holocaust Museum does. It's, it, it, it definitely doesn't have the resources even for doing that. So it's, it. it's, it's sort of a, a meeting between an abandoned site and a slightly marked abandoned site. And then you can have, of course, the guided tour that can add on uh, whatever. And, and, and that will be quite a research, a different research work to sort of follow a number of guided tours and find out what's being brought up there, which could be super interesting as well uh, to do sometime. Thank you. Irim with us, you also have one question, so please, maybe not one, yes. maybe more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for your lecture. It's a very interesting topic and uh, very interesting place. And actually, I have a question about the uh, use of displays of similar places in contemporary political discourses by contemporary politicians. Did realityism uh, fighting or war against some ghost of communism, or maybe it is uh, absolutely contempor contemporalized and used absolutely for contemporary context. Because for example, when we investigate or when we look uh, to contemporary Ukraine, and when we look uh, to anti-Soviet and pro-Soviet narratives, that really we are not Soviet and anti-Soviet, but uh, we are part of contemporary Russian-Ukrainian conflict. It's not about Soviet. And how it is uh, in Croatia? Is it really about past and about communism? Or maybe about some political discourses in contemporary Croatia? <sighs> That's a fantastic question. Uh, and uh, as you <laughs> definitely hint at, it's absolutely about politics in contemporary Croatia. And that was also why I sort of brought in those politicians and their different positions here. But it's not only, there's also there's so, so always more and you have all these different voices. So we definitely had, for example, the survivors organization and you have the, uh, the super dedicated Croatian historians who just really want people to remember this because it is a heavy and important history. Um, but you definitely have that thing about politics and um, and, and, and perhaps that's part of why, now I need to contradict myself a little bit now, uh, because to a certain extent, uh, it is about politics. It definitely is about politics. And, and I was just about to say that uh, because Croatia, ha if you want, if you want to be banal, has won the battle against communism and Yugoslavia, it isn't now an independent state and it is now a, a, a democratic republic. Um, so it, to a certain extent, there's not so much to fight anymore. Um, and there is not so much of a national conflict in it. Um, and th this makes it perhaps less relevant, but I'd say it's, it's, not, it's not an argument that I can actually follow through because, um, because one thing that Croatia really, really is dedicated to is the memory of the so-called so Homeland War 
the war against Yugoslavia or Serbia, 1991 to 1995, where in the end the Croatian armies took over or liberated all of, of Croatian territory as the Republic had looked under Yugoslavia. And that is main the main point of contemporary Croatian cultural memory. And for the last decade or more, it's been a struggle to establish a memorial museum to the Homeland War. And somehow it, it, it never materializes. Uh, somehow it seems to be a little bit of the same story as with Goli Otok, that there is not really a final political intent to sort of carry this project through. Um, and I, I wonder whether that is a, a Croatian thing, that, that basically this is, it's better to keep it vague um, or, or if, if, it, if it's basically a lack of interest in, in this particular field. Um, they, they just seem to need a very long time to decide on these, on these uh, sites of memory that, that, uh, in, in, in the public sphere. Thank you. Well, if you would want to make a parallel, perhaps the really contested, one of the really contested memorial sites is that camp of Yasunovac that I remembered earlier, which is a, used to be a concentration camp under the Second World War run by the Croatian Stasia Fascist, who collaborated with, the, with, 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 with Nazi Germany uh, and, and, and collaborated in the Holocaust, and where 80,000, 100,000 persons were killed, primarily Serbs, Jews, and, and Roma persons. Um, and that is a super problematic site of memory and Croatia could not avoid turning it into a site of memory. And I'm not saying everybody wanted to, but it's definitely a problematic site of memory. Um, and that was also why I mentioned that on the 23rd of August, the contemporary, the current Croatian government, which is leaning right wing, go to the sites of victims of communism, but they do not go to Yasinovac. And that is because I think that the, the issue of Yasinovac involves admitting to Croatian national guilt, to national minorities that might have something to, to uh, actually to rightly complain about in, in relationship to, to, to the Croatian state. So there you definitely see the, it being about contemporary politics. Because if, if we look to Lithuania, I think it's a little bit similar processes. It's, uh, easiest to accept the dark heritage sites uh, related to Soviet crimes, and it's much more difficult to accept uh, related to Nazi crimes in this region, uh, because actually I think that uh, in this situation is easiest to say about Soviet crimes that it is not our crimes. It's something abroad. Actually, it, it, is, it, it's, it is not right thing, it's only uh, one from myths, because a lot of citizens of former Lithuania, of Lithuania before Second World War, we participate actively in Soviet structures. I think that much more actively as in Nazi structures, because actually, yes, it was much more shorter time Nazi occupation. But by myths, it's easiest to accept that it's not our crimes, it's not our, I don't know, uh, problem, it's something abroad. And Nazis, it's included to some national narratives, it's, for example, a prizing of uh, June uh, 23rd of uh, 1941, uh, and then the discussions around this that actually I, I think that probably something similar exists in Croatia because Ustashi regime, it was some kind of Croatian independence, maybe per per perceived by a lot of people like, like this and Yugoslavia, it was something abroad and then the perception is absolutely different. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but yeah, and then just because of... Uh, uh, and I mean, the EU is not in, insignificant here, uh, but what is, what does have, a mon Jasnovic does have a proper museum, a very impressive monument, but then that, if you want that, that, that uh, monument museum has a history that was established already in, in, in Yugoslav times, and then the, 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 not external pressure has forced Croatia to keep that monument museum running and to uh, renew it, and it's actually been re constructed pretty much according to the model that you mentioned cost us the the universal holocaust uh, memory museum and it has some some advantages and some disadvantages and, and i'd say in the case of the narrative of yasanovats 
the advantage of, of individualizing the victims is that you can sort of take out the structural history and emphasize how, how uh, this is a story also of Jewishness and of the Holocaust. And you can talk about Jewish victims and you can sort of downplay the fact that the majority of victims of, of Yasinovic were actually Serbs mm -hmm. built for nationalist reasons by the Ustasha. But that sort of disappears a little bit when, when, when you individualize that narrative so much. So, yeah. Uh, I don't see any more hands raised. So we started a few minutes later and we finished a few minutes later. So we're just perfect in timing. Thank you very much, Tia, for a very interesting lecture and uh, interesting, um, interesting uh, talking about uh, about the dissonant heritage site and how is it reflected in, uh, in literature. I found it really, really interesting. I, I've never thought that uh, 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 literature, uh, not as um, as a memoirs could also create a heritage. It's something new for me and I appreciate that. Um, and I understand that the research isn't uh, over yet. So on behalf of all connection, connective team, I wish you all the best and the great success with the finishing your work. Thanks. And maybe any last words from Costis? Yes, I want to thank you as well. Uh, thank you very, very much for this, uh, this, uh, really very insightful uh, talk and uh, for engaging us in such a such a really good and interesting conversation that really concerns us also talks about matters of concern of all of us as researchers uh, but also as uh, as citizens today and i think that's uh, that's the main things to take is really that uh, it's not just a story about the past it's a story that means a lot for the present and the future as well as heritage does often as memory does often uh, so thank you, thank you, Thea, and uh, uh, I thank you all for being here and for attending this talk. I would like to say that uh, uh, we have your email addresses. Uh, if you uh, don't object, uh, we will be sort of happy to circulate to you uh, uh, the plans for the next talk in this seminar series, which, as I say, is this year's seminar series of the Connective uh, Digital Memory in the Borderlands uh, project uh, of uh, Vilnius University Faculty of Communication. So thank you all for being here, and we look forward to seeing you uh, in a few weeks uh, in our next talk as soon as we finalize the details of that one. And thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure.